You're listening to Paris Search UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to The Spirit Dimension with your host, Kerry Greenaway, right here on Parasurge Radio. A good evening and welcome to The Spirit Dimension. My name is Kerry Greenaway, as you all well know by now, and on a Sunday, I always bring you something a little different, and tonight is no different at all. First of all, I've got a different co-host for you tonight. His name, as you know him well, he's been on many shows on Parasearch Radio, and it's Mr. Ashley Nib. Good evening, Ashley. Hi, Kerry. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're very, very welcome. Now, we've got a very special guest in the studio tonight. He is the paranormal detective. He looks at things in a completely different way to normal paranormal investigators do. Um, Now, this is Mr. Greg Lawson. He is awesome. He is basically an American ex-FBI. Am I right on that, Greg? I am not ex-FBI. No, I'm I'm a current um, supervisor for a uh, large... uh, Police agency in Central Texas. Police agency. Okay, we'll go with police agency. (laughs) So you look at investigations in a completely different way to like a normal person would, I suppose. Because we go in and we go, okay, there's a haunting, there's raps and there's bangs. But you look at it in a very, very strategic perspective, don't you? Well, I try to. Um, And like you said, there's there's plenty of people doing it uh, um, another way. Uh, and it, it seems to me a lot of times that uh, they're doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same results. So it seems to me that when you get to that position that you should probably uh, kind of switch gears and see if something else works, if that makes sense. No, I totally agree. And sometimes the environment is incredibly important in that, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um the environment that you create when you go into your investigation, uh, you know, you, you talk to different investigators and you can come up with, you know, as many uh, different ideas as there are people on what they think is uh, uh, the environment that should be created in order to get some sort of result. And so and, you know, the thing is, is, is the more I get into this, the more I start listening to other people uh, that, you know, I sometimes make more sense. And the, and the, the reason I say that is if I'm going to go in and investigate a haunting, let's say in a house that's abandoned, mm-hmm. uh, it, but it has electricity to it and it, and it has other utilities and we decide to go in there and investigate that. Well, as soon as we go in, we're disrupting uh, the electromagnetic field when we go in. So um, I try to, uh, not contaminate that area very much and only send one person in. We do certain setups and then we move out and monitor. I, uh, I then talk to other people and they're like, well, do you get anything out of that? I'm like, yeah, creaks, groans of the building, um, get some, uh, electromagnetic, uh, um, distortions, uh, based on the, the wiring in the walls, that sort of thing. And then they ask me, or or then they say, well, they believe 
that going into a a place that is supposed to be haunted mm-hmm. by bringing multiple people in and having that activity that actually is the thing that stirs up uh the event i guess or uh, maybe spirits are attracted to a group of people sitting around and just uh, having drinks and playing some music and and kind of paying attention to to what's going on around them. So there, there there's a lot of different philosophies on it, and I'm just going to take my end of it and cover my end of it and let everybody else do the others. I don't disagree with that, to be honest with you. Because how many times do we go into an environment and we kind of forget the environment, we just focus on the fact that there's an alleged spirit there. We don't look at the whole picture of that environment as well. Right. And, um, you know, any time a human being walks into any room, they're going to disrupt it and they're going to leave evidence behind every time. And so depending on, you know, what is in the room to disrupt is uh, is the question, and how do we measure that? Because that's that's another problem with the paranormal is, you know, the scientists are going to sit back and say, well, you know, you're you're using scientific terms, but you're not uh, in, employing the scientific uh, application to those terms. You're 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 molding them for your purposes, which would be called pseudoscience. And I don't have a problem. I will tell you, I, I practice pseudoscience because I'm not sure, you know, what reaction w- we'll get out of this. Um, b- bottom line is how do we maintain our credibility in our paranormal investigation when we go in if all we do is listen to a ghost story mm-hmm. about uh, a spirit at a, um, let's say, a, a cemetery – and we go out there and we just kind of walk around in the cemetery and videotape and talk. And, and that's just not a controlled environment. It's not a, you know, um, it, 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 it's not a scientific basis on what we're trying to do. And, and to be quite honest with you, um, I think uh, the more I do this, um, I think that the science that we work in uh, may not be the thing that actually uh, reveals what this is. I, I think maybe it's something else. I don't know. Okay. But so I, 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 also, I also do a, a talk about paranormal perceptions, and that's kind of where I was going with that, is I'd, maybe it's the way we perceive what's happening that um, we can't quite make sense of. And we're, we're picking up these things, but... Um, it just doesn't fit in our paradigm of what we would expect. So it's very strange, but just an idea. There's lots of ideas um, surrounding this. Like you said, it's a pseudoscience. It's full of theories um, from the weird and wacky to the more prosaic things that we know based in science methods. And it's, it's incredibly interesting, whatever way you want to look at it. We can't back up a lot of what we see. But from a law perspective, you know a police training perspective there are certain key factors that we need to look at when we go into an environment isn't there yes and and you know that's something i i did uh <clears throat> excuse me i did um about 10 or 11 years of research on roswell i i thought um I, I, <laughs> my wife's best friend moved up there and so we went to visit her the week before the roswell conference Mm-hmm. And for, for those of you who are are, are listening, um, the Roswell incident in New Mexico, uh, United States, happened in 1947, and uh, it's where a, a, a supposed um, flying saucer crashed, and it was recovered by the uh, uh, Army Air Corps there at Roswell, and uh, was then taken either to Carswell Air Force Base in. Uh, Texas or Wright Patterson up, um, up north, and the the reason that this was a big deal is because the actual commander of the base released information that uh, they had recovered a you know a flying saucer on a ranch in Roswell, right outside of Roswell. So it was a huge deal, and the next day um, the government came back in and and uh, 
um, overruled that and said that it was just a weather balloon, mm -hmm. which okay. I don't know about you. There's a huge difference between a weather balloon and a, a you know, a spacecraft. <laughs> yeah. So whatever happened out there uh, was a great distraction for people for a while. And the cover up was fantastic because the cover up lasted for about 30 plus years before Stan Freeman stepped in and, and started asking questions about it. So when we're when we're doing an investigation where we're when we're actually looking at what, you know, I mean, like the Roswell thing, that's a 30 year old cold case. Yeah. How do we go in there and actually investigate that when, you know, half of our witnesses are dead and uh, we don't have any physical evidence and um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's there's certain things that I look at from a perspective when I do an investigation and my ultimate goal is to get an indictment from a grand jury in the United States. Uh, when you file in certain cases, when you file a felony charge against somebody, a very serious charge, you will bring it before a grand jury. And the grand jury is just a group of people, group of citizens that actually hear the cases uh, before they go to the court and they decide whether it's indicted, uh, it's called build or no build. So you indict that case and say, yes, we want to send this to court and have a trial over it. So sorry, um, can I just interrupt you to layman sure. term this? It's basically you take it to a group of people in a court of law that say, yes, you've got a case or no, you don't have a case. Yes, I'm sorry if I did. Sorry, I'm layman terming this for people. No, that's <laughs> um, Yeah, and, and in the United States, uh, that group of people are not um, – they don't have to be educated in the law. Right, they are okay. just a, a you know, group of citizens that are pulled to be on the grand jury, and then they hear these presentations, and they send it or they don't. Okay. And so – that's kind of what I try to do in a paranormal situation. So like in the Roswell situation, mm -hmm. um, I go and I investigate whatever I have. And, and the main thing I have is a, um, you know, a press release from the government, from the uh, Army Air Corps saying that they found this, this object. And you go from there. And as you're, you're going through your case, you're building it in my opinion, for that grand jury presentation. I want to build that case to where beyond, you know, any doubt, this is what happened. And now we need to take it to court and figure out who's responsible for it. And the funny thing is, is everybody has a little different perspective on that also, because the yeah. investors that have written a lot of books on Roswell and have done incredible work on Roswell will say, of course, yeah, you know, they would get an indictment on this. And I'm sitting back as a detective saying, you know, no, we wouldn't. You know, if this was a murder, we don't have a body. We don't have a suspect. We don't have, you know, we don't have our witnesses. We don't have this, even though they have been interviewed over 500 people, um, it still, it doesn't matter if they don't have good information. You know, I would take two good eyewitnesses over 500, you know, witnesses that saw a little bit of everything any day. Uh, so how relevant is an eyewitness, regardless of whether or not you've got two or 500, because there's such a thing called false memory and your brain can change things, can't it? Very, very quickly as well. Yes. So how and, and relevant can that be? So it depends on the person. You have to look at the individual person, their credibility, and, and, uh, and you know, what is their motivation to be in this investigation? So that, and there's all kinds of different ways of that. If you have a, a eyewitness that is a victim uh, that is unrelated to the, uh, the perpetrator and they say that this perpetrator came up and robbed them uh, and you check that victim's background and they haven't you know, they're, they have a, a fairly clean background. You can have a, a couple of arrests and, and that sort of thing, and that's not a big deal. But, you know, if you show that, that you are a deceptive, you know, manipulative person, then that's a bad thing. But if 
if the victim doesn't know the suspect and it was a completely unrelated thing, as opposed to the victim is the soon to be ex-wife of the suspect and they're in the middle of a child custody case, then things change. Uh, I all. see. Yeah. It's about the situation, the perspective of that person. Right. And that's fresh memory. If you're talking about extended memory, um, you're talking about as far as false memories, you know, we can, that's something that we could do a, a, a 16 hour <laughs> radio show on because <laughs> there's, there's really good, uh, um, there's really good examples of how people do that. And what a lot of people don't realize is when you're looking, when you're using your eyes and, and you're looking around, you don't actually see what's there. And let me clarify that. The images that you say you see are actually recreations of your brain putting together the electromagnetic spectrum, the visual spectrum, the color spectrum of what it thinks it sees. And I know that's a really weird concept and some people are rolling their eyes at this point, but but that is truly how the brain works. Um, your your eyes do not let the light in and shine on a like a movie screen and you see it that way. They actually, you know, these these light rays are coming into your eyes and they're being converted into chemical and electrical processes pushed into the back of your brain. Then your brain is then reforming them to what we think we see. Yeah. So over time, um, if you don't exercise a memory of what you saw, pieces of that memory go away. And then when you're recalled and say, hey, wh what was it that happened? and you go back to that memory and there's little pieces that are missing, uh, your brain will fill in those pieces for you. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, I've, I've had conversations with plenty of paranormal uh, investigators, especially on the UFO side, on how they don't believe that that's the way it works. Well, they can believe whatever they want to. The, uh, the psychologists and psychiatrists that, that do this research are the ones that came up with that. So I'm going to listen to them first. Oh, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, there was a case, I saw a, a documentary about false memory once, and it's funny enough, it ties in with your Roswell, um, talking about Roswell. And what they did was they took a group of people that were completely unrelated to um, that case or that area or anything else, and they were telling them about the story and the, the alleged situation that occurred <laughs> around that time. And they walked them around the parameter. But what they'd done is they'd set up an area that they'd like cordoned off with armed guards. And then they sort of walked them past and they'd come across this garden. And he did his thing. You've got to go and leave the area and all this. Then what they did was they then took witness statements after the event of what allegedly happened on that walk. And the, the accounts varied so much. Like one person said that he held the gun up to them, which he hadn't, because it was all on camera. So they could verify what had happened and it was really thing that they had on camera so they could prove what had actually happened but the memory of what had happened to those people was so different to what had actually occurred oh yeah and i know the exact uh, show you're talking about oh, and that's good. a that is <laughs> yeah that's one of the best examples. Uh, yeah, because they had them actually wearing the cameras. Uh, so wherever they looked, yes. uh, you know, the, the camera would show what they saw. Well, the, the one lady that said that uh, he pointed the gun at at her, she never even looked at him. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and it shows me that was the one, like you said, it was a great example of how your brain works differently to the reality of what's going on. Right. So that makes you know, that, it, it must make that so difficult as a detective to try and build a case because you you know this you know this stuff so when you're trying to build a case you know you're dealing with not necessarily a true represent, representation of what happened of what happened yeah and, and a lot of times it's a bias representation that we get um, that's why it's so important to tie your investigation with some solid evidence or some solid science with it. 
uh, that will, you know, reinforce what your argument is that, uh, you know, this is what happened. Um, you know, that the, the thing is, is, is when you're, when you're doing a presentation to, let's say a grand jury and you, you have an incident that happened, mm-hmm. um, I, I used to typically just tell them step by step what happened based on the evidence. A car drove up the road. Three shots were fired from the car, striking the house, one bullet going through, you know, the window, striking the coffee table and the couch, Mm -hmm. and the car drove away. Three shell casings were recovered from the roadway, matching a 9 millimeter, which also was matching the bullets that were recovered from the couch and the front of the house, um, et cetera, et cetera. You, you, You go on through the physical evidence of it. Um, then you bring in, you know, the person that was in the house who was in an argument with a person that owns a car that looks like the car that drove by. We didn't have a, you know, a license plate or something to go off of. Um, and then with technology now, (laughs) uh, when you being the suspect in that car, in that shooting, tell me you weren't anywhere in, in the vicinity and I pull your cell phone records and prove that you're lying, that your cell phone was, you know, hitting off of that cell tower right beside the house that got shot. Um, that's when you start dismantling the other person's uh, account of what it is. So there's there's just multiple evidentiary things that you look at to either dismantle the, like in, in this case, a criminal's explanation of what he was doing. Uh, and supporting the evidence of of what the actual incident was. So mm-hmm. there, there's multiple ways to do that, even with a, a cold case or um, a paranormal situation. Okay, Ashley? Yeah, I was also just thinking about that. I was just talking about the, the paranormal aspect of the case of the panel. I mean, but the, biggest, the biggest, I suppose, difficult part of that is that the physical evidence isn't existing as much as it, which makes no. it very- very difficult to tie to tie those aspects in. I mean, I'm um, trying to think of a case off the top. I suppose the case that comes off the top of my head straight away is probably 30 years stride because obviously the original activity occurred back in the 60s, but yet people still equate activity to happen right up until today, um, even with recent events and stuff like that. So I'm trying to thought you can have to link it all back in together to make to come to that sort of raising that cold case from the ground, so to speak, to get to that. Um, I think you call it like the the alpha case, isn't it? And and understanding what ties into it and what's actually happened and what might not have happened and might some what might, might be false memory and stuff like that as well. Right. And and you know when I look at uh, the ghost story, uh, let's say um, there, there's a good example of a uh, uh, the hanging of a witch here in Central Texas that happened at the in the end of uh, the 1800s. Uh, there was a uh, reportedly a woman that lived in a area that's called Cedar Park. And um, she was accused of being a witch. She was hanged by a tree in a graveyard um, just west of Cedar Park. And she's buried in that graveyard. So the real challenge is, is where did this story come from? You know, how do we track back uh, to find the what I call the alpha report. What is the the first report of this story? Uh, in uh, most cases, you're never going to find that. But in some cases, uh, uh, the um, uh, case of the White Lady of Kinsale in uh, in Ireland um, at for uh, Charles Fort is a great example of that. You know, there's a story of um, you know a, a young girl who marries a, an English officer there at um, at Charles Fort. And that night, the English officer is mistakenly shot by her father. And she throws herself from the battlements to the the rocks or beach below. And it's a great story. And most people think it's only a story. Well, it's not. That is backed by very, very, very thin accounts of individuals that, um, because of the military, actually have, uh, uh, you know, some physical accountability of an officer by that name being there 
And so you get a little bit of, of the actual physical evidence. Same thing with, um, and then, and, and that's where you start. Same thing with this, um, the witch hanging here in Texas. Well, it's, it's, it's a big deal. Um, and so how do we find out that, you know, that alpha report, it's very, very challenging, but you know, when you, uh, and, and that's why I consider myself a little bit more of a paranormal researcher than an actual ghost hunter, because that's what I'm looking for. Can I build this case to say that this event that somebody reports happening to them actually has some evidence behind it that you could say, yeah, that would lead to a haunting. And, uh, you know, the funny thing in the United States, um, you know, prior 1920s or so, the the things that you're looking for is what's written in the newspaper because bef- prior to that cops didn't write much of a report you know you do, mm-hmm. you don't find that in the united states up up east up north uh you know new york area boston area they were a little bit more sophisticated than we were down here in texas cuz they you know they found somebody down here in texas in the 1800s you did something bad you grabbed them you you know strung them up and you're done and you go eat lunch so, um, yeah, I think it was much different in the UK. To be fair, <laughs> yeah. So um, it's it's very difficult. But it, the the reporters of the day back then that's where I find most of my you know my information is is written in articles in some some sort of newspaper from from you know those times. That's cool. But. It's still always difficult, though, I find, because um, I've been trying to find articles online. Um, you have to go to the archives, don't you, really? Yeah. Um, so there's a, a a case here in central Texas. Uh, you know, it, it seems like in, in the United States, everybody is fighting over who had the first serial killer. <laughs> you ah. know, it's like this, <laughs> no, I had, oh, no, he was here, you know. And so... <laughs> H. H. Holmes up in Chicago. That was uh, that's that's been held pretty much as yeah. That was probably the first um, you know legit, if you can call it, serial killer. Uh, yet here in Austin, Texas, we had a series of uh, of murders happen here in Austin over about a year period, um, and the the law enforcement that was here and the private investigators that were hired. Uh, and the the political folks that were in charge all felt that uh, they weren't related. It was just, you know, random killings. Well, a, a couple of the law enforcement people um, noticed specific things that were happening. You know, it was it was the same type of person that was being killed. They were kill, being killed in the same manner. Uh, and specific wounds were being inflicted that matched the other victims. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that that was one of the, the first um, serial killings in the United States was in Austin in uh, 1884 to 1886. And um, so and actually the the ser- the person that they were looking for um, actually f- one of them that they were looking for actually fled Texas and went to London, which you know what happened in London. Um, we certainly couple, do. Yeah, two, two years first, after. First serial killer in, in the UK, really. Well known yeah. one, anyway. <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah. There's, well, that's there's, interesting. He's actually come from America to the UK rather than the well known theory that Jack left the UK and went to America. Well, every I'm sorry, everybody, um, you know, is trying to tie into, uh, you know, Jack the Ripper. You know, they tried to tie H.H. H. Holmes over there. Um, there's mm-hmm. people that have tried to tie what is known as in the uh, in the case that I'm talking about. You can look it up. It's it's either the servant girl annihilators, the servant girl annihilator, uh, Austin axe murderer. Um, there's there's several different uh, um, um monikers that they used for him. But w- one of the individuals that they were looking for was called the, uh, uh, the Malay cook. And it was a, a guy that was from Malaysia that was cooking at a restaurant, uh, that, 
um, was very close to the area of where the murders occurred. And, uh, and they were looking at him, but he fled before they actually got a, a, a good interview with him. And he fled straight to uh, the UK. So they tried to tie that. I'm, I'm pretty sure it wasn't him. I'm pretty sure we know who it was. And, uh, um, and it's, I, I think that's why it was never, um, a huge deal because this went out on the AP. I mean, it, they, they carried this story in New York and Chicago and uh, other big cities, uh, about Austin. And of course, Austin is trying to downplay it because it's a up and coming city. Um, and they, they wanted, <laughs> you know, they didn't want that kind of uh, <laughs> attention. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so Greg, on your opinion, who do you think is Jack the Ripper? <laughs> oh, uh, really? Oh, yeah. Why not? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. I, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I, I couldn't. It, it, I, that's one of those things where I, I guess from my law enforcement side, I don't want to point a finger at somebody <laughs> if I don't know for sure. Because I've I've arrested people and I've put people in jail and they've stayed in jail for weeks that had absolutely nothing to do with a crime, nothing. Mm. But the victim needed to um, point the blame at somebody that wasn't in their family. So they provided really good physical evidence, uh, testimony uh, that it was this other person. And, you know, I put him in jail and then when you file, you know, felony charges and get somebody in jail, it's a little bit difficult to get them out. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's I, a I've huge had responsibility, that. isn't it? Yeah, I've had that uh, that experience. And uh, in this in this particular one that I'm talking about, it was a child abuse case. So, <laughs> hey, that's my dog. <laughs> Not my one this time. <laughs> um, in, in in this particular case, it was a child abuse case, mm. and I arrested this guy, put him in jail. He stayed in jail for many weeks. He ends up, you know, I end up getting him out. He's never going to recover from that. When you've been when you when you've been arrested for you know a, a child offense, mm -hmm. whether you did it or not, you're the guy that hurt that kid. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody will look at you that for the rest of your life. Uh, well, what if he, you know, what if he just got off? What if he really did it kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very serious. <laughs> so, uh, I know this isn't as serious when you ask me who did it. Ah, jeez, man. I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> they, they've got some really good suspects. I mean, There's you know, really. There's some amazing suspects. I've read several yeah. accounts on seven different people that somebody has built an incredibly compelling case against, um, and, you then go away and read about somebody else. And you think, God, that's a really compelling case too. You know what I mean? And all the evidence right. is building. And um, now we nowadays they're chucking in things like DNA sequencing and and right. um, more forensic um, research than ever before. It becomes very confusing to like the everyday person um, when you look at that kind of evidence. So when we look at it in the paranormal, there is so much to consider, isn't there? Oh yeah. And, and, you know, I'm kind of in the Russell Edwards camp. I don't know if you guys have talked to him. Oh, yeah. um, I know there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of controversies surrounding, uh, everyone's, um, hypothesis on mm -hmm. what it is. I think he's done some really solid work on it. Uh, I know that there were some issues, uh, with the science behind it, but I mean, uh, you know, how are we going to, I think it's fantastic that, you know, there would be any individuals that out that would actually track down, you know, physical evidence from that long ago. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing on the, the, the servant girl, uh, case I was talking about earlier, mm -hmm. you know, this individual, basically his, his modus operandi was he would come, uh, to your house on a moonlit night, usually a full moon. He would grab your ax from your wood pile because every house had a wood pile and every house had an ax sitting there. He would get that ax. He would take off his boots. He would walk into your house 
and hack you in the head with the ax. No. Then he would drag you out of your house and uh, have his way with you out in the yard, put his boots back on and leave. So he left evidence uh, at every one of his crime scenes. He left the, the murder weapon there um, at, at several of the crime scenes which this is something that was really interesting. Um, the police, the law enforcement that were investigating the case did not uh, release this information till later. But the the women that he did this to, he would, uh, or, or the women that he would do this to were found to have also a hole in the side of their head. And what this, uh, what they uh, surmised was that a body is really hard to move uh, once it's dead or nearly dead. So he would take a large ice pick and slam it into the side of their skull and use that as a carrying point to drag them out into the yard. Yeah. So they didn't. They didn't release that. Did I just ruin the whole? The whole. whole... <laughs> Everybody, everyone's like, there. "Oh my god!" <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and that's what he would do, and he would use that as a uh, as a a handle, basically, to drag them out into the yard. Um, and it's pretty pretty gruesome. So um, going forwards, um, in regards to paranormal investigation, now you've written a book called "Detecting Paranormal," which Ashley has done a blog on recently, haven't you, Ashley? I have, yes, yeah, I don't look at a review a review on the book because I think it's, it's, it's awesome, but it's, it's one of those books that when I first got into paranormal investigation, I wish I'd had line around to read because you lay out every port, important part of an investigation in this book in quite a nice structured way as well, and I like structure. <laughs> Check that out there. Um, you, I mean, we've mentioned in this in the interview so far things like um, uh, talking to witnesses and stuff like that. You mentioned about interviewing properly where you, you let them, they, they tell you the story and and for so many years I've known that many investigators including myself at times as well have have led have led witnesses because we've asked them specific questions rather than letting them tell the whole story and then going back to the story and then questioning the story itself so and also you in the same book you also go on, on sort of things like researching cases and also scene management as well in order to understand so it's, it's, it's a great book actually to be fair. I think it's I think it's really good so it's not just because you're on the show but it's well structured but so yeah, I've I've written a blog on it basically, Gary. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it interests me because going forwards in regards to investigating and researching, we should find our job easier to do because as time moves on, when we look back at cases that may have happened now that are reported hauntings later on in the future, we'll have these forensic and scientific methods and reporting methods a lot more in place than we did when we look at something like for example, Jack the Ripper or Roswell. Yes. They didn't have that, these methods that were readily available a lot more now than they were back then. Right. And, and you know, people, young people always say, why do I need to uh, study history? You know, what does that have to do with me? I'm, I'm living my life. I'm doing my thing. Well, you, the only way that we learn is from mistakes. If you do the right thing every time, then you are untrainable. You have to be able to recognize, you know, improper methods uh, of of your investigation to go off of that. I mean, in, in the in the at the turn of the century, in the 1900s, from 1800s, 1900s, you know, they were studying the shape of people's heads to determine whether they're going to be a criminal or not. Yeah, you know, that's true. that's just uh, it's it's pretty pretty insane. So if you don't know uh, about the mistakes that we've made and are able to correct them, then you're, you know, bound to make the mistakes again. Ashley pointed out, you know, leading witnesses. I see it every time. I believe it's the number one thing that paranormal investigators uh, do that, you know, just kind of mess some things up. And also then they turn around and repeat it incorrectly. Uh, a good uh, example was a TV show where uh, the supposed expert – is talking to uh, a, a witness, and the witness says, um, you know, Margaret Thatcher uh, ha had knowledge of UFOs, and, and, and uh, you know, she was good friends with uh, Ronald Reagan, and uh, 
he blah 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 you know says whatever they're going to say well later he recounts his uh, conversation with this individual and says that Margaret Thatcher told Ronald Reagan about the UFOs. So, you know, we, we even have uh, real problems with conveying what we've heard and, and the uh, interviews that, that we've had the I'm in, in Michigan in um, August, I'm doing a cold case uh, investigating workshop and uh, I'm kind of setting up a scenario of the perfect, you know, this would be just incredible. Um, so the, the scenario would be there's an abandoned house. Uh, you get permission to go into the abandoned house uh, and you know that there was a haunting there. Um, you go into the abandoned house, you look and there's furniture and furniture and things and you find a small dowry chest in the attic. And in that chest, it has letters, it has, uh, you know, hairbrush, it has a bunch of different, um, y you know, evidentiary pieces in there. And how can you help recreate uh, this haunting story uh, based on, you know, this evidence that you, you find? You can go into most old houses and spend only a, a, a little bit of time and recover the hair of the people that lived in those houses easily. And so even though, let's say, you, you know, cause I'm, I don't know about in the UK, but the, the dowry chests of, um, of women here in the United States, you know, sometimes they would cut their hair and braid it and then leave that in, in the chest or they would have their toiletry items. Well, you have all kinds of physical evidence in there and as cheap as those, um, uh, those tests are now, you know, you can easily tie them to make sure that, yeah, that was great, great grandma's hair, you know, her, her hairbrush mm -hmm. and, and then tying also, if there's any letters, letters are fantastic. Um, because people used to write a lot and if they, if they saved them, there's a huge amount of good historical information out of, uh, you know, just personal letters or diaries. So, um, you know, that's about all you have uh, from back then. But now, like you said, in the future, they're going to be able to recreate all kinds of things and, yeah. and support or dismiss whatever the event is. Oh, hugely. You know, with, with, as I say, with the methods that have been progressed um, over the last, God, you know, 40, 50 years, tops, right. I would say. Since the war, it's sort of like becomes a lot more prevalent of pushing those methods forward um we should have an easier job of being able to investigate a real life haunting through a lot more scientific and reporting and recording methods and forensic methods as well it's that technology that's pushed forward that we've been able to utilize i mean we're utilizing that in cold cases like you, see, you know we talked about jack the ripper modern day methods have been applied to that case still haven't come up with a definitive a definitive answer i'm going to use that because there's two or three people that have used those methods and come up with different results but, right um you know regardless of who you've read or what you've you looked into um people have applied those methods to those age old cases and come up with some very interesting results um, so you can imagine in 10, 15, 20, 30 years' time, people, you know, investigating reportings from this era or even 20, 30 years ago era, their job is going to be so much easier than we have today because we're looking at cases that are not, like you said earlier, not being reported properly by police methods because they weren't instructed um, the, um, I can't think of the word, Ashley, what's the word? Procedures. The process. The procedures yeah. weren't in place and the forensic methods weren't available back then and crime scenes weren't um, protected in the way that they are in this day and age. I mean, crime scene contamination is um, very, very protected now, isn't it? A crime scene happens, it's immediately cordoned off. Sure. Because well, Back they, in the day, all and yeah. sundry were going along and having a look and, and getting involved. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, in... in that back to the servant girl annihilator situation, mm. they had uh, uh, one of the last women that were killed 
a 15 year old kid that came up into the crime scene, which everybody in town descended on the house and everybody's walking around everywhere because they wanted to catch the killer. Mm -hmm. So they had mechanisms, uh, you know, they had uh, watchmen and things like that. And so they're ringing bells and everybody's coming out of their house trying to find the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Well, this uh, 15 year old kid uh, walks up to one of the police officers. He's a city marshal and he has an ax in his hand. He says, Hey, I found the ax back in the alley. And so the cop takes the ax as evidence. And that's pretty much it. Um, and you know, the, the evidence and the whole scene was just completely trampled on. People were inside the house. Uh, people were going in there. Reporters were going in there to look at, uh, the crime scene inside the house that night, you know, within an hour or two of it happening. And so it was complete cra- craziness. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, you can't, your, your investigative mindset uh, has to be from beginning to end. And, and if you, you have to eliminate any cross contamination, you know, I, I see it today. Um, you know, there, there will be a crime scene and a cop will walk in and walk over and pick up the gun and go, Hey, I found the gun over here. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what are you doing? What the hell's wrong with you? Didn't you, you know, I mean, it's pretty amazing some of the mistakes that that cops and other investigators will make uh, in that sort of thing. So, yeah, you have to con- concentrate on your investigative process and um, you have to trust your investigative process. And if you standardize that process and you use it time and time again, that will legitimize, you know, you as an investigator – on this is how we do our investigation, which will ultimately uh, culminate in the, uh, you know, assessing your, your information. You know, what is the quality of your evidence or testimonial information uh, based on your process? Because if you go in, you go into the, the local diner um, uh, next to the place that's haunted and you holler out, Hey, uh, I'm going to be over here in the corner. I'm writing a book about the the haunting next door. If you have any information, come talk to me. Mm-hmm. Well, you're going to get a ton of people to come over there because they, you know, might get in your book. You might use their name in their in your book. There's all kinds of uh, exterior motivations why witnesses come forward and want to talk or why people come forward and want to report a haunting. You know, I mean, a, every pub – and every bar in the United States uh, would love the, you know, the little sign out front, this place is haunted. Come in and check it out because you're going to go in there and buy a couple of beers and look around and, and that's great. And we so have you that have... in the UK. Every pub okay. is the most haunted pub or the most haunted yes. location in the UK. It's becoming a bit of a thing, isn't it, Ashley? Just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry on, Greg. And well, and that's that's something as an investigator, when you go in, you have to figure out what the motivation of the people, uh, you know, uh, what are what do they want to get out of this? You know, is this an an old lady that lives in a house by herself and she says things are happening or is this is a young family that just moved into this new house and something's happening? And, you know, I can uh, I can tie uh, a paranormal event to any house. You know, it's a brand new house. Uh, new construction. Nobody's ever lived here before, but they're having hauntings. Well, you know, it's probably buried on an Indian graveyard. How are you going to oh. prove prove me wrong? You yeah, know, yeah. There, there's probably somebody buried on your property because there's, you know, there's graves everywhere, and maybe that's what it is. You can always tie it back to something, um, and that's where you just kind of shrug your shoulders and walk away, and um, and. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's a, it's, it's a hard thing because so many investigators try to tie their evidence to the story. True. And that's something that's, that's very, uh, um, you, you have to be careful of, you know, it, it, it's either just evidence or, you know, when you start really trying to pull it into your story, then, you know, it lessens its credibility. Very true. One, you brought up something actually I was going to ask you about was the Native American burial grounds. Are they as prevalent in the United States as we all, from an external perspective, 
um, looking at stories and that from um, America, are they as prevalent as, as it seems to be? It seems that there's Native American burial grounds everywhere in America. Are they that common? Yes. Oh, they are. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're everywhere. So um, I, where I live in Georgetown, um, I have a park. It's called San Gabriel Park. Um, j- just like uh, two, 200 meters from my house. Uh, I was over in that park one day with my dog and I noticed something uh, in the stream. And I I went over and I looked in the stream and it was Indian pottery. Now, at that time, I thought it was a clay pipe that uh, they use for um, sewage, an old clay pipe busted up. I I had no idea. So um, I didn't really pay much attention to it. Then I I, uh, was doing some research about San Gabriel, the San Gabriel River, which is um, has a lot of history, both Spanish and Indian uh, in, in nature. And, uh, we have a local, uh, university called Southwestern university. And I read some of the, uh, thesis papers out of some of the graduate students, uh, in anthropology and come to find out that, uh, the Tonkawa or Tonkawa, uh, Indians actually lived in saying what is now San Gabriel park. And on the edge of the Creek there, that's where their burial ground was. So that's what I was looking at, uh, where, the city of uh, Georgetown um, redirected some water, mm. and so it 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 had never flowed there before, and so this creek dug down basically into the Indian burial ground there, and uh, and so I went and talked to the uh, the parks people, and they immediately got a couple of uh, um, dump trucks full of dirt to fill that all back in, and you know don't tell anyone because it would be a huge deal. Uh, if, if somebody, um, you know, wanted to make it a huge deal. Mm. So now are they everywhere? Well, um, every few years, uh, the agency that I work for gets a call of a found skeleton and we go out, we find out that the skeleton's 500, 600 years old and, you know, nothing's done about it. And in Texas, if you find a skeleton like that, you own it. You, you are, you actually own <laughs> the bones of that skeleton. So you can do whatever you want to with it. Wow. Uh, yeah. It's, it's an antiquity is it's uh, Texas property rights. You own everything on the property. Um, so there's that because, um, the Indians didn't have, uh, depend on what tribe they didn't have a specific place that they would bury. Like in, you know, in the, in the cowboy movies where it's like the Indian burial ground, and you shouldn't go near there. It's haunted or, you know, it's whatever it is. They also buried wherever they died. Yeah. So an individual would die. They would, you know, do whatever their ceremony is and bury them right there. So it just depends on where the big congregation of, of Indians were on, you know, how scattered uh, they would bury them. The, the Tonka was that were here um didn't bury like the Apaches. The Apaches buried above ground uh, on like platforms and mm-hmm. they, uh, they buried in sacred areas. The Tonkawas were different. They buried in the ground um, and they buried wherever it was the, um, the, the process that they went through uh, that was important, not the location. So it just depends on, on where it is, but yeah, especially around central Texas, it's all over the place. That explains a lot of things to me, to be fair, because it does feel like the whole of America is just one big American, uh, Native American burial ground at times when you listen to various hauntings and every kind of person says, that's because it's a Native American burial ground. And you think, <laughs> really? It's, Could it possibly very convenient. be? You know, I mean, yeah. the whole of London should be haunted on that thing because it's one big whole play pit. <laughs> it is one big graveyard, isn't it? Everywhere. There's yeah. bodies all over London. Or all under London, I should yeah. say. Yeah, I mean, every time they do, you know, do a new building in London, they're digging up, whether it's not a plague pit, it's Roman remains, or there's always something right. they're finding. Well, there's there's a place very close to where I live now. It, uh, it's called the Galt Site, and um, they ran across some uh, uh, some what they thought were Indian 
uh, remains. And they started digging and they came to find out that it was actually a big, um, you know, community that lived there. And the stuff that they're um, uh, testing now for sure is about 16,000 years old. Uh, but some of the pieces they are saying are around 30,000 years old, which would re rewrite history in the United States as far as uh, transmigration of, of, you know, natives from uh, Siberia all the way into South America, which it seems a little far fetched to me. But, um, but yeah, it, it it would rewrite that. There's there's Clovis points and all kinds of stuff that they're finding out of there. So that's the other question is is where's all the 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 caveman ghosts? Yeah. That's what I, I want. To be a caveman ghost that would be awesome. <laughs> Ashley, <laughs> I don't, I, your theory on that one? <laughs> to my knowledge, I think the oldest the oldest one that I've heard that goes back is is funny enough as you mentioned Romans is the is the Rome like a Roman legion marching with their knee height in some basement of some place in England. A treasury Anyth- house in York. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> anything past that, I don't think I've ever heard of anything beyond... No, I don't think I've heard of anything ghostly beyond that, so definitely no cavemen ghosts, that's for sure. But then... Well, I, I figure there's some sort of uh, uh, shelf life on ghosts, I guess. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're only good for a certain amount of time and it just kind of fades away. Maybe that energy <laughs> signature does fade away. Maybe. Right. Who right. knows? <laughs> One thing before we, we let you go, um, Greg, because we could talk to you for hours and hours, I'm, I'm sure, is patterns of behavior. Now, people display patterns of behavior throughout their life without even realizing they're doing that. And they do that within their life and their relationships. And, you know, it's born out of learned lessons, isn't it? When we look at ghosts, how important is it to pin down a ghost's pattern of behavior well i so i think that's fascinating on on my side of it because you know in the united states there's a big thing about um racial profiling um they say well you know it's illegal to racially profile someone so what the united states citizens have 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 listened to and have heard and will regurgitate is cops aren't allowed to profile no, <laughs> that's what we do all day long. We profile, <laughs> you know, y- your car doesn't look right for this neighborhood. Sorry. You know, it, that's profiling, you know, y- y- you, uh, being a white person in a predominantly black area at three o'clock in the morning, that's profiling. Uh, you can throw it in racially if you want to or not, but there's something odd about this behavior or like what you're saying, it, what if it's a repeated type thing? So, I, you know, I've I have a whole list of uh, paranormal profiling or in, what I call entity profiling, mm-hmm. and you know, how does a ghost behave? How does a or what we call a ghost? How does a haunting? Uh, how do you experience a particular haunting at a location? Um, you know, what does a wraith do? when people talk about, you know, an angry ghost. Um, so you look at it and, uh, and then you go back and see if everybody is having the same experience, which, um, they will, if they know what to experience. (laughs) I I hate to say that, but they will, uh, if they, you know, uh, uh, know that the white lady of Kinsale is a woman in a white dress, which there is a whole lot of reports of, of these white dressed women all over the world. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when, when certain individuals are told what to see, you know, they'll, they'll see that. So the real challenge is uh, paying attention to different groups that are going in uh, and what they're experiencing. You know, one group goes into the same, uh, l- let's say, um, uh, Asylum, an old shut down mental hospital. They go in there and one group of people see orbs. The next group of people see a headless apparition. The next group of people see, have something touching them and, and tapping them. The, uh, the next group of people uh, hear something or get EVPs on something. And it's not consistent. 
so what are we dealing with? You, you know, you could talk to Rosemary Ellen Guiley about that, and she would say, well, that's a, a you know, it could possibly be a gin that is there and is mimicking whatever you expect. Mm-hmm. You know, if you expect to see a UFO, you know, an, an alien, well, you're going to, they're going to present as an alien. Uh, they're going to present as a demon. They're going to present as a, you know, woman in a white dress, depending on, you know, what your expectations are uh-huh. and, and messing with you. So that, I think it's really important to kind of categorize what the experience is and and whether that experience is repeatable. And, you know, we could go into the whole time travel, um, you know, time slip. It could be a, a, a psychic impression. It could be, you know, just a, a something that just repeats itself that's caught in time because it was so emotional. Um, there's all kinds of things. But it, it, at least if we're, you know, using entity profiling, um, it will help us better to understand how the event relates to uh, the person, you know, perceiving it. Did that make any sense? It does. It, it actually says, look at the people investigating more than the experience they have. Yeah. Did I say that? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> kind of. Um, but yeah. also look at the experiences. And if there's a pattern there, then that makes it more interesting. Right. Yes. And, and, you know, if you have somebody that has experienced abduction, have seen aliens, have, uh, are, are haunted by ghosts, have had demons come visit them, you know, they have the whole gamut of everything. Um, that in my opinion, um, you know, you should, you should investigate more of their credibility Mm -hmm. on what else is going on. You know, do they have, Maybe uh, some sort of um, sight problem. You know, or, or may, maybe they have cataracts and uh, things are blurry to them so they can't really, uh, you know, see that well. Maybe ha- they have macular degeneration uh, and they have a, you know, a, a, a black spot in the center of their vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, may, maybe, you know, they just can't see well to begin with. Uh, or there could be something else disrupting. Uh, you know, especially if they've been drinking or if they've been taking any kind of uh, in other intoxicants, um, you know, or, you know, pharmaceutical grade uh, medicines that they're on could cause some uh, hallucination or, or, you know, some sort of effects that would uh, confuse their reality. So, yeah, I think it's very important to to vet your um, your experience or make sure that there's nothing you know, outside of their experience that could be causing it. Oh, my goodness. There's so much to consider, isn't there? That's all I can say. Ashley, last words? No, I'm I'm still on board with that. I think you have to vet everything and look at everything when you're trying to figure out what's unknown. So, yeah, looking at the the environment, the experience, uh, and trying to profile the whole whole sort of experience, I suppose, is the best way to look at it. Um, Well, it's been absolutely fascinating show we've actually come to the end of the show thank you so so much greg for joining us and ashley thank you so much too sorry you didn't get much of a word in <laughs> thanks <Ashley. laughs> that's me Please. getting carried away sorry <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on Parasearch Radio. Don't forget, all of our shows go out every single night of the week at 9pm. They're available through the Spreaker channel and YouTube. You can catch up with all the news on our on our Facebook group page and our like page, as well as our Twitter. And keep your eye on those pages because big things are coming and announcements are coming all the time. On that note, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me in the studio tonight. Thank you so much, Greg. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Ashley, for joining me. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. (laughs) And on that note, I say farewell to all of you. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.